Three, two, two, one. one. Biz You're listening to Biz Buzz. Super authentic, actionable advice. We're going to open the kimono and show you what's inside. I'm scared to see inside Mike's kimono. <laughs> hey, it's Mike and Tom with Biz Buzz. <laughs> if you like geeking out over business, marketing, and entrepreneurship, this is the podcast for you. Hello, all you biz buddies and biz budettes. We are excited to be with you again today on another episode of the Biz Buds Podcast. This is Michael J. And I'm here with the ever illustrious Tom Ross Media in the house. Good to see you, Mike. Um, I have a little confession, right? People keep coming up to me and saying cheerio. Cheerio, On Tommy. the back of this show. Cheerio. Literally, I've, I've got <laughs> Chloe, um, wonderful lady who just joined my coaching group. Uh-huh. At the end of the last session, I'm like just getting to know her. You <laughs> yeah. know, she seems lovely. We don't know each other that well. She signs off cheerio uh-huh. in front of the whole group and jumps off. Knowing full well, most people won't know what that reference is. No, and just doing know. it because she knows know. I'm going to hate it. <laughs> you don't hate it. I'm getting t-shirts, cheerio Tommy t-shirts mm-hmm. made for my merch store. It's going to be epic. Cheerio Tommy. So thank you for making me laugh, Chloe. Um, (laughs) All right, what are we talking about today, big guy? We are talking about how to increase your prices. How to increase your prices. So we're recording this at the start of 2021, just to date this show for uh, people who are listening years later. At the start of each year, I, I love the line in the stand that this year, last year is over, this year is starting. And it's such a great time to reassess what you're charging your customers and make modifications to your prices to increase them. Prices increase over time. Mm-hmm. Inflation, fact, baby. Inflation. Um, I just did an Instagram post. And let me uh, share with you. I'm going to have you guess some of these prices, Tom because I did a little research for this Instagram post Mm -hmm. on what things cost decades ago. So we're going to go back to 1940. And in in true fashion of all the quizzes that we do on this show, if you fail this quiz, then you're off the podcast and I'm going to be looking for a new co-host. What was this girl in your coaching group? What was her name? Chloe. Chloe. Chloe right now is my front runner to take Mm -hmm. your place on this podcast as the new co-host to the Biz Buds podcast if you fail this quiz. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, 1940, average price for a home in the United States. (laughs) You're destined to fail because you're not even from our country, but these are the numbers that I have. Okay, average price of a home in 1940 uh, in U.S. dollars? I mean, that's ages ago, so um, not very much, like like three grand or something. What? Shut up, man! 3920 Look at you! Damn! Okay, so um, far... Conf- confession, everyone, I read Mike's post earlier. Yeah, but he, <laughs> but you don't have it up quiz. right now, so <laughs> no, you I wouldn't remember these numbers. No, that's okay. the one number I remembered. <laughs> okay, because it was the top one of the second slide. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go tuition to Harvard in 1940. And by the way, Harvard tuition right now is $50,000 a year. What was the tuition to Harvard in 1940? Um, Okay, let me think about this. Like, I don't know, a thousand? 924 bucks. I actually didn't rem- remember Look that one. Look at so. you go. Yeah. Look at you See, go. I care about staying on the show. I guess. You're so dedicated. All right. Let's go with a, a dozen eggs in 1940. A dozen eggs. Uh, 10 cents. Mm-hmm. I don't know. 33 cents. Okay. All right. Last one on 1940, and then I'm going to give you the 1972 quiz. Okay. Uh, last one on 1940, average income per year. Oh, man. Okay. Um, 
I love how hard you think about these yeah, answers on these uh, impromptu quizzes that I give you on this like show. Seven hundred dollars or something? Oh uh, no, man, no, seventeen hundred dollars a year, one thousand seven hundred twenty-five dollars. Well, I, I was doing it relative year. to the tuition because I presume the tuition is uh, higher than most people's average salary. Hey, that's an interesting way to look at it. But if you look at uh, if you look at Harvard tuition today is fifty thousand dollars per year, and I think the yeah. average household income in the United States is somewhere around $50,000 a year okay. right now. So there you go. So interesting approach. I like that. Okay, let me give you the 1972 quiz. So this is 32 years later, and I chose 1972 to date myself because this is the year I was born. I was interested in what things cost that year. Mm -hmm. A new house in 1972. Give it up. Uh, like 25 or something. Damn, shut your mouth. <laughs> 27,600. <laughs> wow. I'm doing finger guns right now. I just want to shout out to Chloe right now and apologize that your your opportunity to be the co-host the of the BizBuds podcast is going down in flames because Tom is rocking this. Cheerio, quiz. Chloe. Cheer <laughs> cheerio. <laughs> All right. Um, average income in 1972. Ooh, that's an interesting one. Uh, like, ooh, that is really hard. Um, oh, man. Hold on, let me think about this. Like, 15 grand? Uh, close, 11,859. Okay. 11,859. Okay, last you said one. 12 as well, that would have freaked you out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully everybody's having fun playing this game at home. Uh, the tuition to Harvard in 1972, what was it? So, hold on, let me think about this. Hmm. So, I guess it would be... It's been a long day, my brain's not working. Oh, man. I, n I never want to give a you're, flipping answer. You're Mike. already going to get. get you're already going to stay on the show, so don't All worry. All right, phew. You're Just, already uh, going to stay. You're going to be panicking over here. And I'm not going to be bullying you if you get this answer wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be nice. I appreciate that. I'm going to be nice, like um, always. All right, let's go with like, um, I don't know, 13 grand or something. Tuition to Harvard in 1972, 2,800. Re Still cheap, right? Still 2,800. Really wow. Yeah. Way off. So it, it, interesting because it didn't increase. I mean, it, it tripled from 1940, so it tripled over over 32 years. But mm. uh, it didn't increase as much as the average household income or in the average house price, which yeah. 10xed in both of those time spans. Interesting. So, really interesting. Um, so the takeaway for listeners is inflation, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, but do you want to explain the relevance of that for price increases? Inflation. The cost of living goes up over time. And uh, as a result, prices inflate so that people can generate enough money to make the money that they need to pay for their life increases of rent and taxes and uh, the increase in the carton of eggs. And so as a result, they have to start charging more money to accommodate for inflation. Now, inflation yep. varies from somewhere one to three percent per year, something like Typically. that is the yeah. is the average inflation. So it's not a set Every year, you got to increase your prices 1% to keep up with inflation because I think that that's an average. And you're going to have years when, depending who the economic, uh, the, the heads of countries are, influence economic decisions and influence inflation and has a global impact today. But, but suffice to say, prices go up over time, so should yours. So in this episode, right. we're going to talk about how do you start increasing your prices? What do you want to say about inflation, Tom? I want to flip it and talk about depreciation. Ooh. So can you break that down? Okay. Depreciation, mm -hmm. that the value of your assets 
go down over time? How would you how would you uh, how would you define depreciation? Uh, I wouldn't say assets. I would say the the value of cash holdings because you could have an asset like a house that goes up in value over time. Yeah. Okay. So it, it, it's assets that degrade. But a value um, I mean, of a you, car you, depreciates exactly. over time, or like a laptop, and and you know we factor this into my company's accounts. And most companies do you get depreciation of the assets yeah. um, of that yep. nature, but really what we're talking about here is cash. So essentially, if you charge a thousand bucks for a logo, that thousand bucks in ten years' time is going to be worth a lot less because it's yeah. going to have less buying power because stuff's more expensive. Yeah, and this is really timely for this chat because you just put this post out, Mike. I've been coaching some of my coaching group with this. And one of my favorite students, Lynn, she was asking if she should increase her prices. And if memory serves, I think they'd been the same for like five years or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so if you're then getting inflation of 3% every single year, your price is actually going to be, you know, have much less buying power and be yeah. worth less than it was 15 five years less ago. If you... exactly. Which matters, right? So exactly. um, if someone turned around to you today and said, Mike, I'm going to make you charge 15% less for everything you're doing. You would hate that, right? You'd be mm -hmm. like, what? How dare you? Like, you know, that destroys my profit margins. Yeah. I'm going to have 15%, you know, lower quality of living. Pretty much no one would accept that. Yet you kind of unknowingly accept it by not factoring in depreciation and just sitting on the same price year after year after yeah. year. Yeah. Good. Well said. Okay. So. The message between this understanding inflation, understanding depreciation, and looking at the prices of other things that have gone up over time, it is time, listeners, to increase your prices if you haven't done so yet. And we're going to talk today about how do you go about doing this? How do you choose how much? How do you tell this to your clients? So digging in, for me, the, the very first thing that we need to understand, I think, and this goes back to you know some of my pricing methodologies that we've shared on this podcast in the past, but understanding the market value of the work that you do is so critical. And so ask your friends what they are charging. And if you charge less than what some of your friends or what some of the surveys in the industry say that other people are charging, then you have margin to increase your prices without alienating yourself from the market. You can increase your price based on the increased prices of other people. Mm -hmm. now, how do we go about knowing what other people are increasing their prices to be? It's research. It's talking to co-workers it's talking to friends freelance friends it's talking to or it's doing research looking on internet surveys and things or posting on a message board saying hey how much what are people charging per hour for design nowadays and you're going to get a variety of different answers in there but it'll help you understand market value yes and to unpack market value a bit more it can go up it can even go down in some cases. So for example, if there's an industry shift uh, or a shift in technology that renders a large part of your service obsolete, mm -hmm. then demand might go down. And this is all about supply and demand when it comes to market value. So we talked before about how AI is replacing a lot of jobs, including like transcribing, Yeah. for example. So if you're a transcriber, it's possible that despite inflation happening uh, at a national and global level, the demand for your services uh, is rendered all but obsolete and you can actually not even charge the same you were five years ago. You have to yeah. charge less. Yeah. On the flip side, there are some uh, services that may increase in demand and outstrip inflation. So one that springs to mind might be developers and coders. Yeah. And, you know, they've been kind of exponentially increasing and in what they've been able yeah. to charge and what, what they're earning as an industry as you know, we've experienced this tech boom and, yeah. and such a demand in their services and it's a very specialist service and so on. U UX designers is the same thing. U UX yeah. design uh, jobs are, are abundant and the quantity of UX designers capable are less than the jobs available in most areas and so demand is high 
And so yeah. prices go up for those people. So you've got to go the, ahead. The reason it's important to touch on that, I don't want people to understand inflation and think, okay, so I'm set if I just increase my price 3% every year. That's mm -hmm. not how it works. You need to be aware of, you know, the market, market shifts. Conditions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good. Okay. Well said. Okay. The other, the other piece that goes into understanding the range that you can consider raising your prices to is understanding your cost to produce the work that you do. And let me just give you an example. When I sold my agency back in 2015, uh, that first year that I was with the new agency, I did a, a little research on what they were charging for a, a variety of different services. And I would look at our spreadsheets and I categorized them based on project type. And then I averaged out the, the cost or the price that was charged for different types of projects. And then I went and did research to find out how much internal cost was used to produce that work. And this helped me understand the cost that the, the business had to produce a website. Let me give you the example on website. This will come more clearly. So I did this research uh, based on websites and I found that in the 30 or 40 websites that the agency had done, there was an average cost to produce them of $28,000 per website, which means we didn't make any profit if we were charging $27,500. There was no profit in the project. And then I started looking at what was charged for a variety of these websites. And there were websites in the list of 30 or 40 that were $22,000, $24,000. And I was like, man, there's we're not making any money on any website less than $28,000. So I did the analysis. I went to our bid writer. We had a dedicated bid writer at the time. And I said, no more websites less than $28,000. In fact, $35,000 is the bottom of a website bid now. We have to at least make a $7,000 profit on these. So we started increasing those prices uh, in accordance with our internal production cost to know that we were gonna be profitable. Well, this analysis yielded more profitable websites. That we, we stopped having any of these low-end 20-something thousand dollar sites and everything was in the 30s on up, 70, 80, 120,000 dollar websites that we were doing at the agency. And it all came out of the results of doing some analysis on what do we cost to produce the work and creating a floor for our pricing. Now, a lot of creatives out there who are the bulk of our listeners at this point, a lot of creatives have no idea what their production cost is. They're just out there charging $60 an hour because that's what Joe said. And Joe, you trust Joe, so you're charging the same as what Joe said. But you don't realize that maybe your costs are, too, are, are much higher than Joe's and your profit margin is much lower than what it should be. So you got to understand. Just to refresh, uh, um, Mike dropped some bombs on this a few episodes back. It was like foundation to pricing. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't listened or even if you have, I would go and do a refresher listen to that episode. Uh, if right now you're, you're hearing this saying, well, that sounds great. How do I calculate some yeah. of these costs and these profits? Uh, Mike broke it all down in that episode. Yeah. Good. Great point, and you know, it goes into super detail, not to plug my book, but it's the psychology of graphic design pricing. I go into massive detail there. And then I have a pricing course as part of my freelance course also that will, that actually has spreadsheets that you can use that will output this for you. So there, there are a couple tools out there available, but for now, for the sake of this, we're just using this as some foundation to say, here's some mindsets that you can use to start looking at increasing your pricing. So, cool. so I, I know you're about to break down, um, you know, that was mindset and why it's important. I know yeah. you're about to break down, I believe, three ways to do this. Um, there are a lot of different you, ways, but we can talk about yeah. a few. Yeah. Um, before we get into that, yeah. talk to any coach, especially these kind of bombastic, um, you know, you know what some coaches are like, right? Uh -huh. um, and often they'll be like, 
you shouldn't be charging a hundred dollars you should be charging at least 10 grand yeah. per session and that's great because it gets fired people up yeah. you know people fired up and they're like yeah i believe myself that coach yeah. is so inspiring and, and yeah. they go away and then reality hits and it's like well of course they can't charge 10 grand if they were charging 100 yeah they're not there yet and so I really don't want anyone to listen to this episode and go away feeling like, well, that's all fluff. They're telling me to charge more. Yeah. But I don't feel like I actually can or I actually, you know, I don't know exactly how. So yeah. let's make this super practical and realistic yeah. for people. I like it. And that's a great segue to increase your pricing option number one. And that is right now, increase your price by 5%. And I can almost guarantee, I give you a 99.9% .9 guarantee that you will have no detrimental impact on your revenue by increasing your price by 5%. If you charge $500 for something in last year, now you charge $525 for that same thing. Nobody who was willing to pay $500 to you is going to say no because you're 525. And if they do, then they're a price shopping client and you really don't want that person anyway because they're gonna drive your prices down into the ground uh, through negotiation. And they'll say, well, I found somebody who'll do it for 524. Can you be 523? And th this is not the, the business you want to have. So the 5% increase is the easiest way to just trickle up your price with no detrimental effect, no risk. What are your thoughts on that, Tom? I think it's super effective. It's something I've seen time and time again. I would go as far as to say five to 10%. Yeah, I think so, <laughs> definitely. 10% um, probably has no detrimental effect. Yeah, and case in point, uh, Lynn, who I mentioned earlier in my coaching group, she, uh, I think it was 10% price yeah. increase recently. And she was unsure about it as people often are. And, and we had to kind of, entice her to do it and yeah. encourage her to do it and then she comes back the next week and she's like oh yeah all my clients said yeah that's fine yeah and the beauty of a price increase is think how hard you'd have to work to get 10 more 10 percent more business in terms of doing 10 percent more marketing hours yeah or 10 percent more sales or all these things whereas a price increase can be as simple as a decision and then one conversation yeah so in terms of like an hourly rate a five minute conversation, which then yields 10% more money over the next year or whatever. It, it's just one of the most effective ways to earn more money. And I want to encourage people to think about their profit margins. Because let's say you, um, you have $100 that you charge for a, a project and your profit margin is 50%. Mm -hmm. Given the, you know, the project costs and everything that Mike outlined in that prior episode. So your current um, profit on a hundred dollar project is fifty dollars. If you increase that project price to one hundred and ten, because you increase it by ten percent, well, actually your profit then goes from fifty to sixty. So you're not increasing your profit by ten percent. You're increasing your profit by twenty percent. Mm. So and and same with like five percent price increase could yield 10% greater profit in that yeah. scenario. Yeah. And so a client might not bat an eyelid because you know 5% feels like nothing, but for you, you're actually taking home 10% more money yeah. every year, which is, is pretty big. So that's yeah. kind of added incentive to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Think of it. Uh, I, lo I love that. Think of, think of somebody who's billing a hundred thousand dollars a year and their average project cost is $3,000. Well, if you increase your prices by 10%, now you're billing $110,000 a year, and your average project cost is $3,300, but basically you're making $10,000 more and not doing three projects worth of work. You're yeah. making 10,000 more without having to do three extra projects this year versus last year. So you're getting more revenue, less time with just a simple price increase. It's, it's something I, th I think one of the takeaways for the biz buddies today is right now, 5%. If you haven't increased your rates in the last year, right now, 5% 
get off of this podcast and that's your increase, no matter what, it's not gonna have a detrimental impact on your revenue. It's only gonna be positive. Yeah, agreed. And I saw this um, with my coaching fees. I did a, a case study on this where I always encourage people to start with price before they pull on the other levers of generating more demand and stuff we're going to cover yeah, later this yeah. episode, I'd imagine. Because every time I did it, my net earnings jumped up. Yeah. And again, it was just a five second decision. Tweak, yeah. jumped up. Tweak again a few months later, jumped up, right? So yeah. that's how you find your ceiling. You just keep leveling up until yeah. until you hit it. Yeah, I love the, that you mentioned ceiling. That was something that I wanted to talk about uh, in this podcast. Maybe we, we touch on that for a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things to help you get some confidence in increasing your prices, and I, I've taken a lot of my coaching students through this, is I ask, all right, what's your green light percentage? How many projects out of 10 are you winning right now? And most of the people are winning all 10. They're like, oh, well, I, I, I usually win my thing. And my response to that is, then you're not pushing the ceiling of your price point. You don't want to win 100% of the opportunities that come your way. But you don't want to win 100%. Thing, right? They're like, I'm nailing it. Yeah. I'm converting 10 out of 10, go me, but it's not a good thing. No, because if you increase your prices, you're going to price out some of those clients and then you'll be winning less percentage, but making as much or more money than you would have with your lower price. So you've got to know, you got to push that ceiling of where people are saying no. And if you're not getting any resistance, you're nowhere near the ceiling of what you can charge. So start pushing the ceiling. Now, my agency, we averaged a 61% win rate over the 13 years before I sold. 61% of the opportunities that came to us, we won. That, to me, makes me feel like, all right, I did it. 61%. I'm winning more than half. I know I'm pushing the ceiling on my price point on a lot of these projects that... It, and, and people don't say no only because of price. Some people say no for other reasons. They chose someone else because it was a better fit or whatever. So it's not always price related, but at least it can show you that you're pushing a barrier somewhere. So you don't want to win all of them. You want to push that price up to hit some kind of a ceiling where there's pushback. And if you're not getting pushback, you're priced too low, almost guaranteed. I love it. I love it. All right. Okay. So that was a little uh, tangent offshoot. Tom, why don't you talk about, uh, since I just talked off of your topic, why don't you talk about the next one of doubling your rates? What do you think about somebody just saying, okay, we talked 5%. What about somebody who doubles their rates? How do they go about doing that? And what's the mindset they should have? The mindset, I... Um I don't know if I should be ripping off your post or not. Oh, rip off, man. <laughs> rip off, rip it off like a band-aid. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just sound like a massive flirt there. <laughs> rip it all off. Um, okay, so I, in fact, I'm going to read your post here because you put it so beautifully. You wrote, same revenue, half the work. Double your rates. If you charged 500 for something in 2020, now charge a thousand. Some clients will say no, but even if you lose half your clients, you will still generate the same revenue with half the work. This is how to get your life back. And then you had a little caveat underneath that said magic time. What happens if you spend the time you just got back trying to find more clients who will pay you 2X more than you charged last year? Booyah, things will get exciting. So essentially this is, um, this is kind of the first principle of an extra five or 10%, but it's going more aggressive and taking more risk and being willing to lose clients and expecting mm -hmm. to lose clients. Mm -hmm. Whereas the five to 10%, they probably won't bat an eyelid, yeah. right? Yep, exactly. And yeah. I, I think it's good. Um, I guess one, one concern is, and I, I'm sure I mentioned this on the show before, often a client who's in a certain order of magnitude will not be willing to go up an order yeah. of magnitude. Yeah. So what if you do that and you lose all your clients? Yeah. 
well, there's a risk. That's for sure. You have to assess. What's your experience of this? Like, do do some clients go for it or do you have to go find new clients? Um, I, as I increased my rates, I made more money year over year. And, and I did this, I doubled my rates for things. Um, it wasn't a, it wasn't a clear line in the sand because I didn't have a podcast I listened to like this, where somebody was kind of guiding me in this. But I know that in the early days of my agency, especially when I was freelancing and I was charging a thousand dollars for a logo. Mm -hmm. And then I all of a sudden have employees and a a little studio space. And I'm like, wait, I can't charge a thousand dollars for a logo anymore. I was charging two thousand, three thousand dollars for a logo. My price or my revenue just kept going up and up. I mean, I I was billing a couple hundred thousand a year as a solo freelancer. As soon as I started hiring people and increasing my prices, I started billing half a million dollars a year. As soon as I hired more people, I started billing a million dollars a year. And it was largely because the prices of what we were doing was going up. Now, some clients in this situation, they weed themselves out. You yeah, do leave some course. people behind. And, but, and that's not a bad thing. And don't take it personally or emotionally. And maybe you love that client, um, but it's it's no longer the right fit as you scale. I got a few questions. And when it comes to client services, I honestly defer to you. I do it all the time, even with my students and stuff. I'm like, Mike knows way more about client services, mm. you know? Um, I, I love community building and e-commerce yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Mike's the client guy. So I on these episodes, I try and sit in and pretend I'm a listener. Yeah. And I'm like, what are they thinking right now? So I got two questions on okay. the back of that. Okay. And I'm going to give both of them to you now so I don't forget them. All right, I'm ready. All right. I'm going to get my pen. One is how to have that conversation. I think that's going to be the biggest question people would have listening to this episode. It's an awkward conversation. How do I approach my clients and tell them I'm going to charge you a bunch more money? Yeah. So that's number one. Number two, it's great what you're talking about. Like you just kept, you know, raising the prices and and earning more money. But it sounds like you were kind of experiencing this fantastic momentum of growth with your company. It's true. And so that could sustain it. My question there would be, did the momentum facilitate the price increases? Or did the price increases facilitate the momentum? Huh. The chicken and the egg. Because mm-hmm. uh, most people are like, well, I'm not building a team. I'm not getting a studio. It's just little old me. So can I justify or can I command that higher price where I'm just a freelancer sat at home? So yeah. that would be my two questions. Okay, so my response to that is uh, for the just the freelancer at home, and you're cranking and you're working for $60 an hour and you're busy as all get out and you don't know how to scale and you don't even know if you want to scale and the demand is just so high that you can't see straight anymore. You're not charging enough because the demand is so high. So increase your price point to decrease demand, hopefully. And if you don't, if it doesn't decrease demand, then start hiring people because now you have more revenue and more revenue frees you up to invest into the growth of your business. Mm -hmm. Those are the, those are a couple of thoughts that happen there. Now, if you're the freelancer out there that is, doesn't have demand and you're just sitting back saying, oh, I don't have very much work. And now they're telling me to increase my prices. Well, go back to the 5% mindset and increase 5% to at least stay on par with inflation. 5% change is not going to decrease demand. We're talking about an incremental amount. So go back to that. But supply and demand, I think, is really the answer to this, Tom. And and that's one of the core economic principles that you learn on day one of Econ 101 is supply and demand. And if you have a lot of demand, then you need to reduce the supply and you can reduce the supply by increasing the price. Yep. If you have little demand, then you need to, sorry, if you have, yeah, if you don't have a lot of demand, 
then you can decrease the price to increase demand. Yeah. So um, supply and demand is really what what is part of the answer to that. And so that's where the momentum question is, the momentum building. I was dealing with a lot of demand. And it seemed like every person that I hired just increased more demand because it freed me up to go and spend my time doing more business development. And the more business development that I did, the more demand I would have. So you get into so, the hamster wheel. So let's do an exercise. Okay. Um, let's say Mike, he he wants to charge ten grand per project, and he hasn't worked in six months. His poor family is starving; they're going hungry. He's falling on hard times, and then I come to him and I say, "Mike, I need you to do this project. I've only got four grand." Yeah. And I'm the first person that's come along in six months you're probably going to take the four grand. Totally, and you should. Absolutely. So let's change the scenario. For the last six months, Mike has been growing via word of mouth and some marketing efforts he's been doing, and people are knocking down his door. Mm -hmm. So he wants to charge 10 grand. He actually has five clients coming to him right now saying, we will give you 15 grand, each one of them, to do a project. And actually, that's more than you can handle and your team can handle. So you're only going to be able to say yes to three of those clients. So you're going mm -hmm. to have to turn down two, even though they're offering you more than the 10 grand you want. Yeah. So now I show up at your door and say, Mike, I need you to do this project for four grand. What are you going yeah. to say? The answer is, oh, I'm sorry. We just can't work in that price point. Of course. Yeah. So that's an indication of how, and obviously there's gray areas that's between a good, that good example. spectrum. Mm -hmm. But like, this is the importance of demand. So I think people often think about like, how do they pitch it to the clients? And we're going to get to that in a sec too, but like, how do they sell it to the clients? How do they position it? Like all of this stuff. Ultimately, I would say the most important thing is demand for your prices. Yeah. Yeah. Ahead of everything else, all the methodologies in the world, the more demand you have, the more you can and should be pricing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And there, um, are, there are a lot of headless chicken freelancers out there just scrambling around, buried in demand, and it's just evidence of the fact that they're probably not charging enough. Yeah. Because if they were charging enough, they could figure out a way to balance the demand that's coming in. Now, So I, I got I, two side notes super yeah. quick. Um, one is that if you talk about um, increasing by 5% a year to stay a bit ahead of inflation, realize it not only does that um, offset depreciation and keep you ahead of inflation, but it compounds. And we did an episode a few episodes back where we talked about the stock market and compounding interest and that kind of thing. So if inflation's happening and compounding itself at one to 3% every year, mm -hmm. but you've got an extra couple of percent on that, you're gonna be compounding at a quicker rate than inflation. So it isn't just that you'll be earning, you know, on a hundred dollar project now you're charging 105 mm -hmm. over time it's not just going to keep adding five dollars the five percent is going to get bigger so i think that is even more impetus right to increase your prices because yeah. it becomes like an investment vehicle right it's going to continue to compound and elicit greater and greater gains for you because you're essentially outstripping what the market's doing yeah Good. Point number two, and yeah. I'm kind of jumping around here. Yeah, it's You want to cram as much value as possible. Point number two, and I, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Do you think, let's say I've got 10 clients. If I wanted to increase my prices, let's say double them, like we just talked about. Yeah. Personally, I would not email all 10 clients or talk to all 10 clients and say, I want to double my prices. Yeah. Because it's too much risk. I would start with one or two. And yeah. I'd start with the ones I felt were most likely to go for it. Yeah. Because then if I talked to one, two, three, four out of the 10 and they all said, no, screw you. Yeah. I wouldn't then go and do it with the, the other six. Yeah. I think that's really good. I would start with the clients who I want the least. Mm -hmm. The ones who I don't care if they go away, I'm going to reach out to them first and I'm going to tell them, hey, I'm increasing my prices and... Here's the new price point. And then if they leave, then I'm like, okay, so be it. If they stay, then you know that you're 
threshold is okay to go and experiment with the rest of the clients. Yeah. So I would kind of go that route. Let's talk though, uh, you, you segued us into this, but let's talk about how do you go about increasing your price to the client? How do you go about telling yeah. the client? Now, option, uh, I'll give you two different options and I usually used option number two. Option number one is reach out to them and tell them, hey, I've, I've done some analysis of my financials for the past year and I've determined that I need to increase my prices. I love working with you. I would love to continue working with you, but my new price point is X. Let me know if this works for you. I would love to hear your thoughts. So that's, that's the kind of message that I would reach out to a client with if I were going to increase my prices. Now that really applies to people who charge by the hour, which I don't recommend. Uh, but a lot of freelancers are out there, they're still charging by the hour, and sometimes it makes sense to do so if they can't define a scope. Uh, but that applies, that message applies to those types of people. Now option number two, which is what I always did, where the majority of the work that I did was fixed bid, I never said to the client that I was increasing my rates. I just sent them a new price point for the next mm -hmm. project. They come Did in. They ever push back and say, Mike, what the I, hell? This is twice I don't what it was remember last time. any pushback. The pushback would come in declining the project. But again, right. I'm winning 61% of the projects that I pitch, and that tells me that my price point is getting the majority of the people to say yes and keeping some kind of balance in my supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So I never really uh, did that, that first option where I went out and told them, I would just start charging it that way. Now hourly, if you bill by the hour and you have a client who just gives you work and you charge them the hourly rate, yes, you should tell them before you surprise them with a new price. But fixed bid, when you're presenting a proposal and a proposed price, just increase it and tell them that this is what it costs. And if they say, wait a minute, this is more than it was last year, you say, yeah, I've done some analysis and we've had to modify some of our pricing. Our business is growing. We have higher costs than we did a year ago. We can't work in the same price point that we were doing before. And yeah. And most, most business owners that are savvy enough are going to accept that response. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, oh, yep, that makes sense. Kudos to you for understanding the dynamics of your business. That's what they're going to be thinking in their brain. So I, I really hope she doesn't mind me sharing this. Um, but my awesome VA recently needed to increase her prices. And it was primarily like the bulk of the work is now more social media. Um, you know, content and strategy and so on. And so when she approached me about a price increase, maybe I'm like this dr draconian client, but equally I'm running a business with my personal brand. It's not hugely profitable and I'm aware of market rates and stuff. So my response was totally fair. I understand um, how I feel about it is I now view the work you're doing in kind of two camps. There's the more basic administrative VA work, mm -hmm. and then there's the more advanced creative social and content work. I'm happy to pay more for the social content work because I think it commands a higher market rate, mm -hmm. but I'm not willing to pay more for the VA work because I think I'm paying market rate. Mm -hmm. And if you're not happy to do it for that, no hard feelings, but I would go and find someone else at that rate to do it mm. comfortably. So we had that conversation. So yeah. she's gonna end up getting more money for the bulk of the work and I'm happy to pay it because it's more appropriate, but yeah. that's just an indication of going back to the market rate point we made before. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's an indication of hoping that your clients are mature and mature enough in business savvy enough to have that type of conversation back to the vendor that they're working with. Yeah. But I think don't be afraid to have those mature conversations. Don't be afraid to be the one to increase your rate and have the mature conversation with the client. You can have confidence in increasing your rates if you understand market value and your production costs and you understand inflation and you understand your supply and demand. You can have a ton of confidence. Just 
analyzing those things that we've talked about on this podcast, Mm -hmm. analyze that, and then increase your rates with confidence. Because when you sit down with the client and they start pushing back, you can think to yourself, oh, well, I whatever you say, you can kick and scream. This is what you think in your head. You can kick and scream all you want, but I know based on my analysis and research that I can't keep working at the lower price that I was working at. Outside of that advice, and I know we've got a couple of minutes um, left here, so I I think there was one kind of 10x your prices. Maybe we could do that. There was a a 10x your prices. Yeah. I, I think, you know, that we've got some episodes planned around like that higher level. Yeah. Go into a different increasing order of your value uh-huh. exactly so yeah, yeah we can maybe do an episode on that but i'm trying to channel my inner listener again to wrap us up here yeah okay i think it's all been great advice but it can be quite nerve-wracking one of the most nerve-wracking conversations yeah. to have with a client they've been paying your bills it's your livelihood you're going into this conversation often from a position of internal weakness um and fear thinking well what if i screw it all up yeah you know you're your palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms spaghetti. Uh huh. What do you do? Ooh, that's that's killer, man. You should write it like a rap song around that. <laughs> <laughs> How do you approach that conversation confidently? Because, you know, on one hand, I've been in this position back in the day, and I start floundering around trying to oversell almost and talk too much, and I'm like, yeah. you know, because we're getting really great results for you, and we can get you even better results, and you mm-hmm. go into like sales mode mm-hmm. instead of just saying, "I'm doing this." Like, mm-hmm. how do you approach that? I think that's a great question. Um, if you're going to increase your prices in a dramatic way, make sure that you go into the conversation not caring if the client says yes or no. And if you're afraid that you're going to lose this client, that you're genuinely going to lose this client and they're going to act irrationally, you're afraid of that then maybe you should scale back the the quantity that you're going to increase your price so that it's not so dramatic to uh, alienate that client. Mm-hmm. I think um, you know I'm I'm all about getting price confidence, and price confidence comes from valuing the work that you do, valuing your time, understanding your cost to do business, understanding the market value, it all comes and builds confidence. And that conversation, when you increase your price, should come with that confidence. You're not trying to pull a fast one on the client. You're just trying to go in and get the value that, or get the revenue that is equal to the value that you provide the the client and equal Mm -hmm. to the market value that other people are getting for the same type of work. And if you know those things going into it, you're not going to have spaghetti arms and weak knees going into the conversation. You just got to know your numbers and have confidence going into it. And you got to go from a place of authority and confidence in that if this client says no, then I'm just going to take the time that I spend doing low priced work for them and I'm going to invest that newfound time into finding clients who will say yes at this new yeah. price point. You got to lose yourself in the confidence. Lose yourself. Shot. Yes. <laughs> you got to wrap it, man, if you're going to be <laughs> quoting right. it. Um, Shout out to Eminem. It's that time again. Uh, yeah, Eminem is my bro. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much, all the biz buddies, for listening. This was a fun episode. I can't wait to do a follow up uh, in the coming weeks with mr michael um but yeah super hope that was helpful i think this is going to be one of those standout episodes we point a lot of people to because it's it's such a direct question that we both get all the time how do i increase my prices so i hope you enjoyed it and equally if you've got friends or peers who are asking you this question or, or moaning about their prices point them towards this episode it would mean the world